All right, so thank you for coming. Um, so this is kind of a year in review um, of 2023 um, of some interesting cases we had um, at the ARC. Um, we're one of uh, three major wildlife rehabilitation centers um, in this area. Um, and then we have some other partner organizations that help us do some of our rescues and recoveries as well. Um, the ARC is one of the um, facilities that has the highest intake um, and that's because of where we're located. Um, we're located right on the beach. Um, we have the ship channel um, and then we have the barrier island with the marshes as well. Um, so all of those habitats are home to all kinds of different animals, um, all of which end up unfortunately um, a lot of times with human interaction, sometimes environmental things that happen to them. Um, so we get a wide variety of animals every year. Um, so over the uh, 2023, uh, we had 1,188 animals come through the arc um, of 153 different species. Um, our top four um, were green sea turtles, brown pelicans, uh, loggerhead sea turtles, and laughing gulls. Um, loggerheads have, over the past couple of years, and we'll talk about that more later, have become more common. Um, but they're the majority of what we saw last year, um, and the rest of them averaged from maybe having 20 of each um, to a lot of species, we just saw one or two. Um, and then we also had 19 confirmed Canastridale sea turtle nests and two green sea turtle nests last year. Um, so that's one of, that's our, was our first nest in Canastridale um, in April of last year um, that's pictured on there. Um, so over the year, um, you can kind of see when our busy seasons are. Um, it started off in January being pretty busy. Um, we had several um, green sea turtles, um, and then we admitted some chemtridalies from out of state as well um, that were cold stun patients. Uh, kind of got quiet in February. Um, the summer is kind of our peak month as far as young birds that get into trouble and need help. Uh, kind of slowed down in the fall. Um, and then last year, um, we had a fairly mild winter, um, so we didn't see any big cold stunning events um, in December. Um, so in January, we started the year off with 130 admissions um, of 27 species. Um, so 62 green sea turtles, most of which were cold stunned, um, and then 26 brown pelicans. Uh, so when the weather gets cold, um, we get turtles in, uh, but we also get pelicans um, at the same time. Um, so one of our first interesting birds um, was a Bonaparte's gull. Um, our staff named him Napoleon. Um, and he was admitted on January 17th uh, with some bruising along his wing uh, right out here by the UT pier on the rocks by the channel. Um, he was released after he was in care for 21 days. Um, and this is a species the ARC has only seen two or three times. Uh, they're a fairly small species of gull. Um, and you can see they kind of breed way up in Canada um, and up in the Arctic um, and then spend the winter down here um, on our shorelines. Um, then in January, uh, we had Zeus, um, who was a Phrygianus hawk, uh, which was the first that the ARC has ever had. Um, and that's Dr. Whitaker examining him, and she's here today. Um, he was admitted on January 19th, and he was found by Corpus Christi Hawk Watch uh, personnel. So Hawk Watch is an organization. Um, we have a local group in um, Hazel Baysmore Park in Cal Allen that count all the migrating raptors um, and are pretty involved in uh, raptor conservation. Uh, so they noted that he had a pretty droopy wing, um, he couldn't fly, um, and seeing these in our area is pretty rare. Um, there are two or three that we can find kind of in an inland grasslands here. Uh, they're like big open agricultural areas in the winter, um, and they're a pretty big species of hawk. Uh, so we did x-rays on him and found that he had been shot. Um, so he had a fracture of his ulna, uh, so we wrapped that. Um, it was immobilized um, to allow to that should say heal. Um, and then also with that being lead um, ammunition, um, we also treated him for lead toxicity just because it was slightly elevated. Um, so that is him after he had his wing wrap removed. Um, we put little bumpers on his wings so he didn't injure himself anymore. Um, and there he is towering over two big red tailed hawks in our flight cage. Um, and after 101 days in care, um, Zeus was released um, up near where he was found. Um, and that is Libby with Corpus Christi Hawkwatch, who found him, who was at the release. Um, so one of the most common issues that we see in our area um, is fishing line. Um, often with some of the brown pelicans and the laughing gulls, um, we're able to kind of bait them in and catch them. Uh, but there are some species, cormorants and herons, that aren't as easy, um, easy to catch. 
so this heron uh, was caught, uh, captured by uh, Fawn, one of our volunteers. Um, he'd been over near the ferry landing for a while um, and his beak was completely entangled close, um, so he wasn't able to eat. Um, so he spent, uh, he was pretty skinny um, and he spent 37 days in care um, and he was able to be successfully released um, back out to where he was found. Uh, we try to release all of our birds near where they came from. Um, they all have pretty established territories, so we try to put them back there. Um, so February uh, slowed down. Uh, we saw 13 species in February, um, 42 animals that came in, uh, mostly sea turtles and pelicans again. Uh, we did have a Willet who is named Will Nye. Um, and he came in on February 24th, um, unwilling to put weight on his right leg. Uh, so it's pretty common to see shorebirds um, out on the beach that have adapted to having one leg or one functional leg um, or just one leg in general. Um, usually they can still fly away though. Um, he did not. Um, he was suspected he may have been hit by a car. He was found on the road. Uh, so he eventually did regain use of his uh, leg um, and he was released um, after about a month um, back near where he came from. Um, so then it started getting a little busier again um, in March, um, mostly with green turtles and brown pelicans again. Uh, we did have an Eastern mud turtle, which is the first that the ark has ever had. Um, his name was Bordeaux. Um, and he came to us in the beginning of March. Um, he was found at, an, um, so a delivery of crawfish had been brought in from Louisiana to HEB. Uh, there was a family that was cooking the crawfish um, and noticed there was a turtle in the pot. So they called us, um, he was uninjured. Um, obviously because he was transferred across state lines accidentally, we can't just drive him back to Louisiana. Um, so we asked Texas Parks and Wildlife what to do. Um, and they told us to release him um, back in East Texas near his native range, um, in, well, within his native range near the Texas-Louisiana border. Uh, so he was released after his traumatic experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then a species that's becoming more common, um, brown booby was a bird that was fairly uncommon in the Gulf of Mexico. They were pretty rare in Texas up until a few years ago. Um, that range map um, is a historical range map um, that's still what Cornell Lab is publishing in their field guides. Um, and that has changed. The entire Gulf of Mexico um, has pretty much been overtaken by these guys now. Um, they're found inland. Um, they're probably breeding somewhere in Corpus Christi Bay. Um, so they're pretty common now um, to find them um, and becoming more common in rehabilitation as well. Um, so this guy came in on the 19th of March. Um, he was found on the beach out here on Mustang Island. Um, and typically when we find these guys, they're just really tired, um, a little thin, and usually they don't have any real serious injuries. Um, they are susceptible to some fungal infections, so we treat that um, prophylactically when they come in as well. Um, and then these guys are also um, long distance flyers um, and they plunge dive for their food. Um, they'll chase flying fish um, in the bow wake um, of ships. Uh, so they have to kind of be perfectly able to fly um, and their waterproofing has to be perfect before release. Um, so you'll see in this next picture, this blue tank that we have um, is what we use for these guys this year. Um, and it ended up working really well. Um, they were able to get in and out of the water. Uh, they maintain good waterproofing. Uh, the way that waterproofing and feathers kind of work in birds um, is that it's a system of hooks um, that kind of uh, keep everything together, keeps the water out and it keeps the warmth in. Uh, so with the defect in their waterproofing or their feather quality, um, they become cold um, and also they don't repel the water um, to be able to float um, and get out of the water once they dive. Um, so mango was another bird that actually somehow fell out of the sky and was found here on UTMSI property. Um, he was the same condition as the other one um, and was also released offshore um, after he was back up to where he should be. Um, so April got a little busier again. Um, we saw 120 admissions in April. Um, one of the first ones um, was this dime, Texas Diamondback Terrapin. Uh, they're a species um, that's kind of in decline right now. Um, he was found on Mustang Island Beach near the Beach Lodge. Um, he was slightly dehydrated um, and a lady who was shelling on the shoreline found him among the shells. Uh, so he spent 23 days with us, um, and then he was released in a suitable habitat. Um, these guys like estuaries um, and brackish water um, with lots of specific grasses that they like to live in. 
Uh, so we found that habitat for him uh, with some help from Texas Parks and Wildlife and returned him back out there where there's other terrapins. Um, and then we had a white-tailed hawk. Um, her name was Miss May um, and she came to us the 13th of April. Um, and she was found uh, in an area where there was a pair of white-tailed hawks um, that had a nest. Um, she was found down on the ground, um, brought into us. And when we x-rayed her, uh, she had a fracture of her coracoid um, and she'd been shot um, right up um, kind of in her shoulder area, um, fracturing that bone. Uh, so she was an adult female bird. Um, her brood patch was still present um, and everything indicated she was probably from that nest and had recently laid eggs. Um, she was a female bird. Uh, so we treated her as quickly as possible. She was with us for just 27 days. I mean, we released her back at her nest site. Um, hopefully she was still able to go and help tend to the chick. Um, the other bird was there the whole time that we had her. Um, and these guys actually nested near my house. And as of three or four days ago, um, the pair was still there. So we like to think it's her. <laughs> um, and then we got a least bittern, uh, which are kind of cool. Uh, we don't see them in rehab very often. Um, they're a very small species of heron. Um, he was an exhausted migrant and we released him after just two days with us. Um, they eat a lot of insects um, and hide in the reeds. Uh, so the way that they stand like that, uh, when they think someone's looking at them, they just kind of stand and put their beak straight upwards and think that they're a piece of grass. And that's their defense mechanism. And it does work pretty effectively if you try to find them in the wild. Um, so then things picked up again in May. Uh, we started seeing some of our younger uh, species coming in, our baby birds. Um, our sea turtles slowed down a little. We saw 51 species. And then we had multiple species of young birds that came in, maybe 10, uh, 10 to 11 um, of each species. Um, one of them was this Eastern Screech Owl. Uh, so he came to us um, as a um, small nestling uh, fledgling, which is just a bird that has kind of developed some of their blood feathers, uh, not really flying yet, um, and had jumped out of the nest too early or something had happened to his parents. Uh, so he'd been on the roadside for several days with no sign of a parent. Uh, usually we'll tell people when they find birds at this age, uh, leave them where they are, try putting them back in the tree, the mother's still around. Uh, these people had been watching for at least three or four days, the bird hadn't moved um, out of this off the side of the road. Um, so we told them we would take it if they could get it to us. Um, and he was released back where he was found um, after 77 days. Um, that picture is about midway through his um, stay with us. Um, and then we also in May had Jack and Rose, which were two green sea turtles um, that were admitted from Padre Island National Seashore. Um, they were found entangled together. Um, there was a little line around their neck, but mostly their front flippers. Um, Jack's front flipper, front left flipper was attached to her front right flipper. Uh, so it was during um, May, um, they may have been mating offshore, which is the only time an adult male and female sea turtle should really be together. Um, and got um, wrapped up in a line. Uh, so these both took some pretty long, um, a pretty extensive amount of time with us. Uh, they all went through antibiotics, laser therapy, um, all kinds of things to get them back up to uh, good health and get their flippers in a good condition. Uh, so Rose was released first after 39 days and Jack spent 91 days with us and they were both then released back on North Padre Island um, near where they were found. <laughs> Uh, so adult sea turtles, um, have, um, you can tell male versus female uh, based on their tail. Uh, so once they hit maturity, the males will develop a really long tail. Uh, so this one is Jack um, and that super long tail on there indicates he's a male, which is something that we don't see very often uh, since most of our turtles around here are all juveniles. And then we had Waikiki, who was a loggerhead sea turtle. Um, so he came in right at the end of May, um, Mustang Island, marker 68. Um, so the reason we've been seeing more loggerheads recently, uh, we don't know why, um, but their condition um, that they all come in is kind of a chronic debilitation state called debilitated loggerhead syndrome. Uh, so they come in, um, they're really anemic. Um, so the percentage of red blood cells in their blood um, is really low. Um, their protein levels are low, they're pretty dehydrated, um, and then they're also uh, not able to maintain their blood glucose, um, and then they're also covered with a really heavy amount of epibionts on them. Um, loggerheads are typically a slower-moving turtle, um, so it's normal for them to have some barnacles, 
but the big anomalous growth all over their flippers, head, and carapace can indicate something's wrong with them, and they've been debilitated for a while. Um, so that picture over on the right um, is a species of acorn barnacle called turtle barnacle, um, which is one of the most common things we see, as well as green and red algae. Uh, we also see some gastropods um, and some bryozoan colonies on them as well. And then we'll sometimes also find little crabs and other things living, um, bristle worms living on them as well. Uh, so this guy uh, went through the, the full treatment. Um, he got fluids every day um, with glucose in it until he was able to maintain his own blood sugar. Uh, slowly introduced to a tank, started eating. Um, and these guys, since they're reptiles, um, they take a long time to get better. Um, and whereas humans at levels of anemia where these guys uh, wouldn't survive, uh, reptiles can survive at dangerously low levels um, um, of anemia. So it took him a while to get better, but 131 days later, he was released back out on Mustang Island Beach. Uh, so June, it got even busier. Uh, we saw a bunch more loggerheads um, and our young birds continued coming in. Uh, so one of them was this crested caracara who came in on the 9th of June. Um, he was emaciated, dehydrated, anemic, um, and had a trick infection. Um, so we treated him for all of those things, um, and he gradually um, got better. Uh, started eating on his own right away, um, and we released him back where he was found after 39 days of care. Um, these guys aren't really migratory, and they're not found in most of the United States. Um, they extend into Texas um, and some of Arizona. Uh, they are kind of spreading their way north and expanding their range, uh, but we're really the only state that sees them um, as far as rehab goes um, in South Texas. Um, so we released him back where he was. Uh, he was a first-year bird, um, so he had hatched um, in 2023, um, and he flew back over to where he was found where his parents were. Um, and then we had a red-shouldered hawk slightly after. Um, he was a fledgling, emaciated, um, had just been sitting on a front porch of someone's house for over 24 hours. Um, usually um, at this age, um, it's called a fledgling. Um, they're starting to jump around, perch on things. Um, they're up, kind of bright and alert and responsive. Um, he was not. Um, he was just kind of sitting in the corner. He'd been there for over a day. So they brought him to us. Um, and we found he was super skinny. Um, so probably hadn't been something may have happened to his parents. He may have just not been getting food or outcompeted by other siblings. Uh, so he spent 47 days with us um, and then was released back where he was found. Um, so for all of these um, raptors, um, not so much scavengers like the Karakira, uh, but we also do make sure they are able to hunt um, before we release them back out into the wild. Uh, so he grew up, passed all of his prey testing um, and then was released. Um, July just kind of kept going on the same track as June. <laughs> we started seeing some more green sea turtles. Um, so this was one that was found over at Bay Tree Condos Marina. He was named Petty by the kid that found him. Um, they were a family that was staying over there um, and he was outside walking and saw a turtle down at the end of the ladder that thought was entangled. Uh, so the family called us and we went over there and there was this long rope that was attached to that ladder. Um, and then on the end of the rope, there was line stuck around that that was attached to the turtle. Um, so he could get up to breathe, um, but he couldn't go anywhere. He was kind of tethered in place. Um, so he had some pretty severe wounds and swelling to the flipper um, that was entangled. Um, so he spent 77 days with us and then was released. Um, in the summer, we try to release all of our green turtles back out into the bays. Um, these guys eat a lot of sea grasses, um, and most of them are hanging out in the bay systems. And then in the winter, um, in theory, they should all migrate offshore. Um, so we will release them kind of after uh, November out into the open Gulf. Um, and then we had our great horned owl um, from July 19th. Uh, he was found in a wastewater treatment plant, um, contaminated, his feathers were disgusting. Um, so he had several washes and only spent eight days with us and then was released, and there he is sitting on top of the telephone pole after his release. Um, August kind of kept going the same. We slowed down on some of our baby birds, um, and we're seeing more of our usual patient or adult patients again. Uh, we did see some more loggerhead sea turtles, though. Uh, this was Kokomo, and he was admitted um, on the 5th of August. 
Uh, so we do have a partner for, um, so our response area um, is from Packery Channel all the way up to um, West Matagorda Peninsula. Um, so we have a partner organization um, run by Bridget Berger, um, the Mid-Coast Sea Turtle Network. Um, and she kind of responds to the upper part of the coast um, and transports the turtles down to us so that we're not spending our time driving up and down. Uh, so she helps us out a lot. Um, she found this guy. Um, he also had a fractured flipper. Um, he spent 92 days with us in care, um, going through kind of the same treatment as the other logger had went through. Um, and then we also, at this time of the year, see our young brown pelicans start coming in as well. Uh, so the pelicans that have the yellow feet um, and kind of the white tips and edging to their feathers are all first year hatch year birds. Um, so this guy at this point is probably two or three months old. Uh, they kind of leave the rookery islands, um, and some of them aren't as smart as the others, um, and get into trouble. They come in, um, kind of uh, run into problems with fishermen, um, and some of them just aren't cut out yet um, for being able to feed and forage and be on their own. Um, so we'll see a few uh, birds like this every year. Uh, so he was emaciated, dehydrated, anemic, covered in lice, um, and then also had par internal parasites as well. Uh, which can be pretty common from these guys um, that are eating mullet and things in the bays. Um, he was released back on marker 34 after 42 days in care um, and he flew away great. Um, so one thing we do with our pelicans um, after we release them um, is we do uh, put leg bands on them and monitor their tracking, uh, kind of track them uh, we don't have transmitters on them, uh, but if people see them, uh, they can report them to the national database. I um, mean, it creates a map like this one uh, where it shows where the birds are moving to. Uh, so Tiny George was a pelican that was rescued on the North Jetty. Uh, he was released back on the North Jetty, uh, then went over to the Harbor Bridge, then came back to the South Jetty. And then yesterday he was in the Corpus Christi Marina on the breakwater. Uh, so it looks like he's just flying up and down the uh, Corpus Christi ship channel. Um, so we'll see if we get another report of him in Mustang Island or Port Aransas again this week. Um, he hasn't been released for long, but he has flown a long way. Um, then September came around, uh, slowed down a little more. Uh, one bird we did get in September uh, was a Swainson's hawk. Um, he was, unfortunately, which happens with a lot of our raptors, uh, was another gunshot wound. Um, which is illegal and reportable, by the way. Um, he had a fractured ulna. Uh, he healed pretty quickly, and we released him after 38 days. Um, Swainson's hawks uh, spend the summer kind of throughout the um, western United States, and they migrate all the way down to the southern part of South America for the winter. Um, so part of their natural history is before they migrate, they kind of eat like crazy and fatten up. Um, they'll follow tractors around, they eat a lot of insects, um, grasshoppers, things like that, as well as rodents, uh, small snakes, um, whatever they can catch. Uh, they have pretty small feet, so their prey tends to be a little smaller than the other birds. Um, because he came in um, at the time that he did, um, we kind of, with these guys, always have to be careful. Um, they have a migration window, um, and if they don't migrate with all the other birds, um, it's kind of recommended by Fish and Wildlife that we keep them until the next migration comes through. Uh, we were able to find other hawks um, through our collaboration with Hawkwatch Corpus Christi. There were still Swainson's hawks migrating through the day he was released. Uh, so he was released with them um, and flew off into the kettle um, and hopefully migrated with them to where he needed to be. Um, then October was kind of a weird month. Uh, we saw a lot of seabirds that we don't usually see. Um, and then our pelican numbers picked up still. Um, and then we saw some more loggerhead turtles. Um, so we did have a stranding event um, of pelagic birds. Um, I know a lot of these were posted um, on social media saying there was a bird found on the beach, not really sure what it was. Um, uh, we went and responded to all of the ones that we saw. Um, most of these guys were shearwaters, uh, which are a pelagic species, which means they spend their whole life out at sea. Um, so this bird in the picture is a great shearwater, and we had 10 great shearwaters that came into rehab with us. Uh, this species is not one that is even necessarily seen annually in the state of Texas. Um, so to have 10 of them, uh, plus we knew about some others that had perished on the beach as well, um, was super weird. Um, we also had six quarry shearwaters, two Audubon shearwaters, two sooty terns, a mink shearwater, a tropic bird, and a Palmer and Jaeger. 
Um, unfortunately, of all of those, the Jaeger was the only one that was released. Um, but the rest of them um, are currently at Texas A&M College Station, and hopefully through some necropsies they're doing, um, they will find maybe some answers as to what happened down there. Um, we also had, at the kind of the same similar time, um, a yellow rail that came in. Um, he was found on the shoreline at Mustang Island State Park, um, and usually these guys are not found um, anywhere on the South Texas coast. They're kind of central and northern coast um, all the way down to Florida. Um, so he was pretty cool. Um, and there's the second record of one occurring in Nueces County. Uh, both of them were at Mustang Island State Park though. Um, and then we have Gizmo, our barn owl, that is everyone's favorite um, and has been all over our Facebook page, um, has have his two siblings he has now. Uh, so he was found when his nest was destroyed accidentally. Um, barn owls nest in hunting blinds um, and open spaces, um, open barns. Um, and oftentimes people come into their blinds at the beginning of hunting season or they'll close up their barns or close up their blinds um, or to knock them down uh, and they'll find these guys inside. Uh, so usually if people contact us, we tell them kind of let the birds that are in their fledge and leave on their own. Um, it is technically illegal to intervene and interfere with them. Uh, but in the cases where the blind has been completely knocked down and there's no other structure around, uh, sometimes we do have to take them in. Uh, so this was his intake picture. Um, and on the end of his beak, he still has his egg tooth present. Um, his eyes weren't open. Um, and he's gradually progressed to the picture on the right. Um, that was him last week. Um, so he's completely lost all of his downy feathers. Um, his feathers are all hard pinned now. Uh, so the next step for him uh, will be making sure he can catch live prey and then release for him. Um, and he is still with us. Uh, so November um, 72 admissions. Um, this guy was found on Thanksgiving. Um, so he was found upside down on the rocks behind Channel View condos. Um, his x-rays showed that he may have had some mild pneumonia. So he went through a course of antibiotics uh, spent 33 days with us and was released. Uh, so every sea turtle that comes into us uh, not only gets its full intake form with measurements, uh, checking for tags, things like that, uh, they also get at least some basic blood work and a set of x-rays as well. Um, so one of the views that we take looks straight through their lung fields, um, kind of horizontally through the turtle, um, like that picture. Um, and then we had Petey, the brown pelican, um, who was rescued uh, at the beginning of November from the North Jetty. Um, he had a hook in his left wing, a large tear in his pouch. Um, he threw up a shark dorsal fin during his intake um, and was released where he was found after 41 days. Um, so pelicans do not naturally eat sharks, um, especially filleted ones. Um, so a big problem um, with brown pelicans um, is that they end up depending on humans um, for food. Um, especially the ones that are on the jetties and familiar around fishermen. Um, unfortunately, as cool as feeding the pelicans is, um, it teaches them that people are good. Uh, they come up to people um, and they're being fed kind of unnatural things and it puts them at risk for being um, entangled and snared in fishing line um, and hooks and things like that. Um, so pelicans in the wild eat some, some small mullet. Uh, most of their diet is made up of little fish and anchovies. Uh, they kind of dive into big bait balls, um, scoop up a bunch of fish at once, the water drains out of their pouch and they swallow them. Um, so big fish carcasses, um, hardhead catfish, um, pieces of tuna fillets, um, we've seen giant tuna eyeballs in pelican throats, um, aren't natural food for them, uh, they can't swallow them. And a lot of those catfish barbs as well can cause some pretty serious damage um, slicing their pouches um, and their neck. Um, so we really advise people to not feed pelicans, um, and it's better for them as well. Um, so then December came around, um, and we saw mostly more pelicans, and we started seeing some waterfowl come in as well um, as they started migrating in. Um, so this is a Cooper's hawk that came in. Um, they're a wintering bird in our area. There are a few that breed here. Um, he came in and spent just a few days with us. Um, he'd flown into the side of the trailer and was released pretty quickly. Um, Cooper's hawks um, are the guys that'll come to bird feeders. Um, they'll eat the little doves and sparrows and things off of feeders. Um, so some people don't like them, um, but that is their prey. Um, they primarily eat birds. 
and they are not here all year round. So you only have to worry about your feeders for half the year. Um, so we had 198 green sea turtles come in in 2023. Um, so this is kind of a trend for the past 10 years um, of how many turtles we've had. Um, so it kind of slowed down, kind of came up again. It spiked in 2021 when we had that big massive freeze um, where we had the um, 1400 turtles in a week. Um, and then 2023 was actually one of our slowest years um, for green sea turtles, even looking back through further historical numbers as well. Um, brown pelicans, on the other hand, um, I'm not sure what happened in 2014. We had a lot. Um, but after that, um, it kind of tapered off again. Um, and we're now we're seeing um, an increase again. Um, went down a little last year um, in our brown pelican numbers. Um, our loggerheads, however, um, we used to get maybe 25 to th uh, 50 a year, um, 2017, um, that may have been a case that not all the um, deceased turtles were responded to um, after Harvey um, on the beaches out here as we weren't able to survey them. Um, but it's pretty stable up until last year. Um, and that's when we started seeing those debilitated loggerheads coming in, um, some of them, 10 of them a day, uh, which is nothing we'd ever seen before. Um, and all of those animals, um, alive or deceased, um, had some data collected from them, samples were taken. Um, we're still not entirely sure what caused it, um, but all the turtles presented in the same way. Uh, 2023, um, we saw another loggerhead pulse, uh, but nowhere as close to um, what we saw in 2022. Um, and then laughing goals um, have kind of become less common in rehab um, since 2014 and prior to that as well. Uh, they used to be, several, I mean, a, at least 100 every year. Um, now we're seeing a lot less. So hopefully they're avoiding people in fishing line and doing well out there. Um, so there's, um, so we get phone calls all the time, kind of how do we get involved? What's needed at the ARC? Um, various different questions we have. Um, so volunteering is one thing. Uh, we always are in need of volunteers, um, not just day to day, um, kind of doing our feeding and cleaning and things like that. Um, but a lot of our volunteers also do our rescues. Um, once trained, um, they help with different cold stunning events and different um, uh, programs that we do as well. Um, there are two numbers, uh, primary numbers for reporting animals that are in need of assistance. Um, so the first number um, is our number and then one eight six six turtle 5 um, is a statewide number. Um, you kind of click the number for the location where you are um, in 24 hours a day, it'll connect you to someone who can respond and help you out. And then we also thankfully have friends of the ARC and Lee Harrison, the director is right here up in front. Um, and they have donated uh, $320,000 uh, towards equipment and furnishing of our new bird rescue center um, that is coming this year. Um, so they do a lot of fundraising um, and help us out a lot as well. Um, uh, we also do have our Pelican Band Reporting Program uh, where we can track birds um, that have been released from the ARC. Uh, currently we have bands on about 330 something pelicans. Um, this guy, XZ5, is probably our most reported bird on record. I think we get at least two reports of him every single day. He lives on the jetty here. Um, everyone reports him. He's in the same spot. Um, if you go drive up to the jetty and look in front of the parking area, you'll probably see him. Um, uh, so these can be reported either through reportman.gov. Um, all you need is the three-letter code that's on their left leg. Um, or there's different programs on iNaturalist or email where we also um, can get the data from them. Um, and then we kind of track their movements post-release. Uh, we've had a couple of birds go down to Mexico um, after release. We've had several go down to Brownsville. Uh, we have a couple in Port O'Connor right now. Uh, we have one that went to a nesting island in Mississippi and then came back. Um, so they really are moving all up and down along the Gulf Coast, um, which shows that when we release a bird and two days later it's in Brownsville, uh, clearly what we did for rehab worked and it was able to fly however many miles that is, um, and they're doing really well down there. Um, so another thing, um, kind of getting involved. Um, so cold stunning is an event that happens usually in the winters. Um, and now is a good time to bring this up as there is a potential for this happening next Tuesday and Wednesday. 
Um, so when the water temperatures drop below 50 degrees Fahrenheit um, for a prolonged period of time, more than maybe just a day, um, since turtles are ectotherms, um, their body temperature fluctuates with the environment. Um, so when the water temperature drops below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, their body temperature is also dropping below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which means they become lethargic um, and they're not really aware of their surroundings. They're not really aware they need to lift their head to be able to breathe. Um, they're often found floating, uh, so susceptible to being hit by boats um, and predation from animals along shorelines. Um, they can have secondary issues to their eyes and various other things um, from prolonged exposure to very cold temperatures. Uh, so most of these are green sea turtles. Uh, we do, we have seen all species except leatherback during cold stunning events. Uh, but 99% of them are green sea turtles, um, and they're found in the shallow bays, especially near seagrasses, uh, which is their primary diet. Um, so we often rely on public reports for these, uh, whether it be recreational fishermen, uh, boaters. Uh, we get a lot of these turtles from duck hunters. Um, as they're out there with airboats, kind of in the navigating in the shallow areas that are usually difficult to be accessed by others. Um, so they're able to get into that really shallow water um, along those shorelines where the turtles are. Um, so we do ask the public um, during these cold stunning events uh, that to kind of be on the lookout um, if you're out on the water and along these shorelines. Um, and that one eight six six turtle 5 number, um, if you call that number, um, if you're out in the middle of nowhere in an airboat um, heading back into the dock and find a turtle, um, if you've talked to us, we can deputize you to pick that turtle up. Uh, kind of tell you how to handle it um, and bring it back to the dock where one of our volunteers can meet you. Because um, that will be the turtle's best chance of survival um, rather, leaving, rather than leaving it out there um, and us trying to find a way to get to it later. And that's what we got. Now we got time for questions. If you have any questions, just raise your hand and I'll come around with the microphone. That way everyone can hear your question because they might have the same one. All right. Yes, where would the uh, cold stun turtles likely be? Um, so we usually will find the cold stun turtles on the back side of the islands um, and the bay side. So we'll find them um, along the bay side of Mustang Island State Park, uh, kind of around Wilson's Cut area, Shamrock Island, and then on the back side of um, um, two years ago, we actually had them on the back side of San Jose Island as well. Um, so kind of on Aranza's Bay. So usually what you're looking for is the shallow bay waters um, and then looking for the direction that the currents are pushing. Um, and they're usually found on the shorelines that are kind of receiving all the debris and the current and where the currents are pushing everything to. Um, and those shorelines are usually, sometimes there's one turtle, um, Bridget up in Port O'Connor um, during that big, or two years ago, uh, went to the shoreline in Espiritu Santo Bay and came back with 200 at least. Um, so it kind of depends on the bay. Uh, during this upcoming event, it is supposed to be a little colder um, further north up the coast. Um, so the Espiritu Santo Bay, Galveston Bay area um, might see a few more turtles than what we'll have here, um, but it should still, as of now, be a fairly mild event. <laughs> All right, next question. Who names all of these animals? I love the <laughs> names. <laughs> um, so sometimes um, our staff and volunteers who go out and rescue them name them. Um, sometimes we'll let the public name them. Um, we'll go out and the people that find the animals want to name them. Um, so if they have a name for them or their kids have a name for them, um, we go with whatever they come up with. And sometimes it's really weird, but we go with it. <laughs> sometimes it's really creative and sometimes it's really not. <laughs> He did. So it's um, so you can stitch them back together. Um, so it's kind of just, just I can fill in Dr. Whitaker. <laughs> So for a ripped pouch, um, they sometimes will come in where they're torn all the way open um, and the fish will be actually going in and coming right back out. Um, for sew those, to sew those up, what we usually do is they do get sedated and then um, suture those closed, um, usually with a two layer suture, although we're finding that we don't have to do that quite as much. 
um, and we can just keep those and they, they heal really well, which is surprising. Um, some of those will be, you know, torn from here down and they're so stretchy. Um, and lots of times we do have to debride off part of that if it's dyed, but yeah, we just suture them closed and um, it, work, it works really well. Yeah, the smaller holes on some of them, they'll have little small holes from catfish spines and things like that. And those will contract down by themselves. But if it's a case of they eat the fish and all their food falls out their mouth, um, then obviously we have to intervene so they can eat and recuperate while they're with us as well. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. What's, what's been the most difficult rescue you've ever done? Difficult rescue. I think the winner of that is still the um, 200 pound loggerhead at the very end of the South Jetty. <laughs> <laughs> that one, and then, um, I mean, obviously when, uh, when Tony was around, we also did some uh, pygmy sperm whales and some other stuff, which are obviously also not easy to move. Um, but I feel like the, the, the bigger animals that are in the weird places are the, the, the hardest ones to recover. <laughs> How did you get it off the end of the jetty? Uh, we made a sling for it. And I think there was two of our staff there, a volunteer and uh, three uh, people on the jetty that volunteered to help. And uh, cycling through people in about 45 minutes, um, we got her off. <laughs> That's a big turtle. <laughs> Any other questions? What's your mortality rate? <laughs> um, so for turtles, um, it's honestly fairly low. Uh, most of the turtles that come in to us, especially during cold stunning events and things like that, that come in alive um, are able to be released back out to the wild. We do unfortunately see some that have already not made it when they come in. Um, cold stun turtles can look dead even if they're not. Um, so we try to bring everything in, at least give them 24 hours and then kind of reassess them. Uh, but the ones that come in responsive usually bounce back pretty well. Um, a lot of the fishing line entanglement and things like that do really well. Uh, brown pelicans are pretty resilient. Um, we do really well with those guys. Um, there are some species that are a little more not, they're a little more high strung being captivity and tend not to do as well. Um, and then unfortunate, well, some of our birds as well come in kind of in a condition where they'll have severe injuries. Um, and unfortunately, the kindest thing we can do for those is humane euthanasia for them. Um, so we're, we're, when we try to rescue, um, kind of go past that initial intake um, and kind of say that a bird is a good candidate for rehab, um, I'd say we usually do pretty well with them. From last year, I would say that 40 to 50% of birds that came in were released. And kind of one of the things that I was told when I first started doing rehab and went to one of the conferences as well, that usually, unless there's some kind of weird human interference, all the animals that come in, come in because there's something wrong with them. Um, so anything that we can release back out um, is basically a win for us. Um, so we kind of try to look at it that way that we, I mean, 50% may have had mortal injuries where we unfortunately couldn't fix them. Uh, but the other 50%, we were able to give them a second chance that they wouldn't have had otherwise. On some of those big loggerhead turtles, what is the pulse rate? It's one to two beats a minute sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. 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 
<laughs> it's still slower than a mammal. <laughs> All right, next question. Yeah, it, it's just a comment. Last April when we were here, um, our grandchildren came for a week and we were having a morning walk down <clears throat> like <clears throat> marker 19 down to 30. And we saw this loon and he was just, he was crying and it was so sad. And so <clears throat> I didn't know what number to call, but <clears throat> Linda, <clears throat> excuse me, Linda Reed, who volunteers at the park, mm -hmm. called her and she connected us with the number. And then we called and we stayed by him until they came and took him. And, <clears throat> and then the next day we called because the grandkids wanted to know what happened to him. Did he have, did he die or did he survive? And they did have to euthanize them. And, but they, under, they understood that they'd had dogs that had to be euthanized so they could understand that. And it, I was really happy that they did give us the information. So the kids knew and, but it was so sad listening to him. I mean, literally it sounded like a cry. Loons have a very unique wailing call. Oh. <laughs> they do. <laughs> All right. Just a quick question. Are you fundraising or are you building a new rehab place here? You mentioned Friends of the Ark. Um, so the um, so our bird um, rescue center um, has been our existing one has been demolished um, and the new one is being uh, built. Um, so Friends of the Ark um, with Lee is a, um, a 501c3 nonprofit that does fundraising for us. Um, so we kind of have the, the shell of the building uh, paid for and then Lee's raised the money to be able to furnish it with all of our caging and tables and freezers and things like that um, to get everything operational and usable once we have the building up. Any other questions? Andrew, how many birds have you seen in your entire <laughs> life? I don't know. <laughs> how many birds yeah. in total? No, 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 like species. How many have I seen? Yeah. 550 something. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> okay, go ahead with your question. I know that in past years you have had tours of the ARC and that this year, um, I, I can't remember what organization says that you are not allowed to have them anymore um, because of, I forget what reason. Could you, would you would talk about that just for a second? Do you still have tours? Um, so our tours are postponed um, for now. Um, if you know more about that, do you wanna comment on it? <laughs> um, um, I'm Dr. Whitaker again. So um, yes, our tours are suspended right now. Um, and part of that is because the USDA is now in control over um, places that have birds and that show birds and things. And right now, because of our bird building, as you heard that it has been demolished and we're gonna build a new one, um, right now we can't meet those standards. Um, it's a really good thing. It sounds bad to hear, you know, you can't do those things. But the idea is that we will be able to do those in the future once we get back up to that. But right now, um, because of just circumstances and what's happening, we, we won't be able to do that for a bit. But again, um, don't give up on us. <laughs> um, it's going to happen. And again, it, all it does is it ups our standards. So it's nothing that's bad. It's nothing, you know, it's disappointing for this short period of time but just know that everything's gonna get better and this is all for the better of the animals and for the better of the ark and the staff and everybody to do a better job. So yeah, so please don't, don't beat up anybody over this. Um, <laughs> it's just the way of the world and it's a good thing. It's an opportunity for improvement. Exactly. <laughs> all right, another question. Do you have an estimate for when the tours will be back on? Oh, no. Probably no. Okay. not currently. <laughs> we, 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 have to get our, we have to get our building built first. Um, so, you know, those, those, that's our first step is once that building is built and then once we get it furnished and then once we're able to get everything 
underway again, then that will happen. But right now, we do not have an estimate for when those tours will start again. Um, it all kind of depends on when we have a building and then have everything up to code um, and set up after that. Right. So we're, I mean, we're, we're, all, we're all hopeful. The other one's been torn down, which was a really good thing. Um, and so we're just, you know, as things start to move and, you know, everything moves a little bit slower than you ever hoped that it will. <laughs> I mean, we're probably looking at at least the next 10 months at minimum. Right. <laughs> probably a, a year at least. Probably, yeah. I mean, they're, they're hoping for you know, August for the building that there's, you know, there's, everything gets a little bit muddled and slowed down a little bit. Any other questions? All right, well, let's give Andrew a round of applause. <laughs> so as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, this is just the first of our whole public lecture series. So if you come back next week, we will have a talk on weather um, and we will be talking about the year of 2023, a review of the weather um, that we've been seeing. And these events will keep occurring, our lectures will keep occurring every Thursday night until the very end of February, which this year is a leap year. So we have one on February 29th, which is usually a day that doesn't exist. So yay, <laughs> come back and see us next week if you want <laughs> and have a good night.